Welcome to the Monster Guys podcast, Halloween in July edition. We have some very special treats and perhaps some tricks <laughs> in store for you tonight. Now please remove your heads and your arms. Oops, I mean your hats and your coats and your shawls and leave them on the rack. Now please be so kind as to join us in the dead center of the ballroom. To her, she simply lost her head. <laughs> now watch your step around these little fellas. They're simply here to trip you up. <laughs> <laughs> some goodies for our trick-or-treaters, don't you? You wouldn't want to upset them, now would you? Michael, be careful. Watch your step here. Where is this? Where are we? Watch out. Oh my gosh, Michael, watch out. Look. What? What do you see? What is it? I spy. I spy with my little eye. It's Halloween in July. Welcome to week three of Halloween in July on the Monster Guys podcast. Michael, we're already three-fourths of the way through the month and having a lot of fun doing it. Yep, and we've got a uh, kind of a crazy topic tonight. Yeah, a fun topic tonight and a really powerful topic uh, next week and somewhere in between that, we've got a lot more information coming about the two boxes that we're giving away. So stay tuned, folks. We're not done with Halloween in July, and I hope it's giving everybody a chance to mentally cool off from this summer heat and look forward to Halloween, which is just just around the corner. Uh, our little guy this week asked me, he's like, Daddy, when is Halloween? And I told him, he's like, yes, we're almost there. So I was pretty excited. I, that's parenting done right, I guess. I mean, it's just over 100 days away, isn't it? Somewhere around. Yeah, it's, I think it is pretty close to 100. I'd have to look at the calendar again, but I think it's 102. I don't know by the time this thing airs. <laughs> Uh, as of this taping, I think it's like 103 or 104 days away. But by the time this airs this week, it'll be pretty close to right out 100 days. So pretty excited about that. Just a quick note, this episode is sponsored by The Fear Merchant. Uh, our good friend Richard Martin from Ireland and his show The Bazaar Cast. That's B-A-Z-A-A-R, as he would say. And uh, we encourage everybody to check that out. Richard is a great friend of the Monster Guys and the Monster Guys podcast. He's been with us all month celebrating Halloween in July. will be with us again tonight, uh, but he has his own show. And he talks to just a wide variety of people from the film industry, authors and producers and artists of all kind, a lot of it dealing with horror themes. 
uh, and some of it just dealing with other very interesting topics. So uh, some music. You know, like he's interviewed Chris Cavarato from Werewolves in Siberia. We've been on a show once and and he's been on ours. So I'd encourage everybody to go check out the Bizarre Cast. You can find that at SoundCloud. Or if you just go to thefearmerchant.com, he's got just all of his links to everything. He also writes for UK Horror Scene and does film reviews and, and things like that. And of course, you can find him on Twitter at The Fear Merchant. So just a, a great guy and some really cool content that he's putting out there and really interesting conversations. And they just keep getting better, in my opinion. I, I've got a couple of favorites from back when he started, but uh, he's got some really great topics going these last few podcasts. So he only has, I think, maybe just under 20 shows, but man, they're just, they're growing and they're getting better and better. So check that out, thefearmerchant.com. You can look up the Bizarre Cast uh, on SoundCloud. Uh, you really just punch in the Fear Merchant and it's all going <laughs> to come up. Yeah, it will. Real excited to partner with him on the Monster Guys podcast and especially this month. And tonight we'll be talking to him. Our topic tonight is jack-o'-lanterns. Jack-o'-lanterns, Will-o'-the-wisp, and other foolish fire, which is right up his alley uh, over there in Ireland. So going to get his feedback on that. We've got a lot to talk about tonight as well, Michael. Uh, but before we get into the topic of jack-o'-lanterns, I'd like us to back up just a moment and just have a moment of remembrance. We lost a great man in this community, what I would consider the horror community or the film community or the entertainment community. Uh, as most everyone probably knows by now, George Romero passed away this week. It was very sad. I, I was looking forward to the TV show. I'm sure they're continuing it, but I know he was working on that recently. Yeah, I hope so, but it is a very sad event. Apparently passed away with a short battle with lung cancer. And, you know, as influential as he was in his lifetime and will continue to be ongoing, you know, I don't think he ever really got the notoriety that he deserved and certainly not the financial backing or rewards from the work that he put out there in his lifetime. But you know what? I think he's just one of those legends now that really enjoyed what he was doing while he was alive and did it regardless and is an inspiration to all of us just to keep going no matter what the industry says, no matter what people say, you just keep doing what you love. And whether this lifetime or the next your legend will grow. And his certainly is. You know, Stephen King called him one of his greatest collaborators. Del Toro tweeted this week as well. He said, if you want to honor George Romero, go watch one of his films today. And that's that's pretty good advice, you know. I mean, he's got a lot out there. Of course, his zombie films he's famous for, but he did a lot of other stuff too. Uh, as a matter of fact, our friend Chris from Werewolves in Siberia, if you go to his website, werewolvesinsiberia.wordpress.com, uh, I believe it is, he did a nice write-up on Romero and all of his films and even some of the stuff that didn't make it to screen or to video that, you know, he, he goes back and reminisces about. So pretty cool there. But we do want to take a moment and just, I guess, as a community, say thanks to a man who really put his all into something that most people just wrote off as nonsense, but really became a legend in doing so and left behind a legacy of great art to be viewed and consumed for generations to come. No doubt his influence will continue to spread, uh, just like the creatures he was so fond of. Yeah, and you know what? I mentioned this in our Instagram post earlier this week. We had no way of knowing that Mr. Romero was going to pass away this week. But one of the items we put in our horror box to give away this week is the director's cut of one of his films on DVD. So I, I think... You know, as sad as it is, it's pretty cool that that's one of the things that we chose that we found at one of our favorite stores, Good Mischief, here in Tulsa on Route 66. I found a copy of that DVD, and Michael over at Good Mischief helped me put that in the bag, and that's going in the horror-themed box as part of the giveaway at the end of the month. Kind of a cool tribute coming out from the Monster Guys at the end of the month. 
to George Romero. So we'll remember him, his legacy and his legend and the influence that he's had, not just on zombie culture per se, but on the film industry, on independent artists and, you know, just across the board entertainment. He's, he's, like I said, he's a legend and it's just going to continue to grow. We got a note from somebody in private message that I'd like to read. By the way, everybody who's sharing tweets and Facebook posts and emails and stuff like that about Halloween in July, really appreciate that. The conversation has been really cool several days each week, whether it's been about scarecrows or about masks and the the pictures people are posting and the little tidbits and folklore and insights. It's just really cool to see that conversation going. Just keep it up, guys. We appreciate it. We got a note, and I'm not going to say as name because he sent it in private message, but I'm just going to read the note because it was pretty cool for us to receive this. And I think it it's worth uh, sharing with our listeners. He says this, I just wanted to say, I absolutely love the podcast you guys do. It has become life for me. And I listen to you at work every chance I get. I've started to focus on my own books recently. I've always been more of an artist and you two are a huge inspiration for that. So thank you. You're also a huge contribution to my realizing how much I'm in love with mythology and folklore from around the world. I've always been big into theology and philosophy, but I never considered how much some of these stories and creatures contributed to the broader picture and their culture as a whole. I look forward to the next podcast and the first chance I get, I'm adding some of your books to my library. So much love guys and keep up the great work. You two are always a huge inspiration. You know what? That means a lot to me and I know it does to you, Michael. Oh, yes, especially the part about kind of igniting that excitement for mythology again. That's something that's always been pretty close to our heart and something that we absolutely love if you guys out there listening can't tell. So whenever we see that fire stoked in somebody else's heart, it's, it's always really exciting. And I don't know, it's just it's a joy for us. It really is. So thank you for sending that message to us. Again, that was private message. Uh, so I don't want to say the name just in case he doesn't want to be identified, but you know who you are. Really appreciate it. Means so much to us. And you know what? From time to time, we get these kind of messages or uh, little inspirations of art, different things like that from people. And it really does make our day. It makes our week. It makes our month. You know, this is not an easy thing to do day in and day out, especially when you've got so much other going on. And this is not our main gig. So this is something that we do truly because we love it, because we love what we're talking about, and we love interacting with you guys. So when we get something like this in our inbox, man, it just, it completely fuels us for, you know, a good bit. And it it means a lot, like I said. So thank you again. We appreciate that. And if anybody else wants to send us a nice letter or two or three or something, (laughs) you would keep us fueled up for the next few months. It certainly does help. It does help. Michael, before we get Real deep into the topic of jack-o'-lanterns, I'm reminded of a year, several years ago, uh, you and I were invited to help design a haunted house, and we ended up helping to lay part of this house out, but then we had this huge part to ourselves that we could design. We decided we were going to do a kitchen scene, and it was one of the first (laughs) scenes in the house, so it had to be spectacular. Yeah. So it was this huge wraparound kitchen, and I just remember having so much fun with that and and knowing what else was coming throughout the rest of the house and that we were kicking it off. You were this this mad chef or mad butcher type guy, and I was a creature you had chained up in the cupboards, and I don't know, do you remember that? That was a lot of fun that year doing that. I can't forget that. I mean... (laughs) We did a pretty smash up job. I mean, you were hidden in a cabinet. The house, I feel like it was under some sort of renovation. So a lot of those cabinets were open. Like it, they didn't have doors on them. Yeah. Well, it was a, a city that owned this house and this property. And it basically had fell into disrepair and was not being used. And they decided to give it over to us that year to do a community haunted house. And it was a pretty big house upstairs yeah. and downstairs. We had effects coming from the stairway, all kinds of stuff. But it was, Pretty cool. That that whole scene, you were just, 
madness with that <laughs> cleaver and some of those dishes, but it was loud because of all the stuff that you were clanging around, but you would always back people up into my cupboard. Yeah, well, there were a few cupboards, and I remember there were some people that would immediately come into the room, and it was kind of a U-shaped room where they had to go yeah. you know, in that, that U-shaped line single file there were some people that would turn into the room and immediately back into a cupboard because of what they saw and then we had some people that actually fell to the ground and tried to scramble to get all the way through yeah so i'm i'm on one side of the room and they've got to walk past me which some people had a lot of issues doing and get to the other side of the room well at first it looks like i'm the only you know scare actor in there so they get to the other side of the room and then you pop out of the cabinet toward the end of the other side of the U. And we just, I remember there were some people that we would kind of corner. It sounds bad, but it's a haunted house. It's a lot of fun. And I think that's part of the thrill for people going to the haunted houses is finding themselves in that situation. Yeah. What I loved about the room was there were a couple of false cabinet areas that people expected something to jump out yeah. and it didn't. And so by the time they got to me, they were already looking ahead to What's coming next? That, that next room was in full sight. Like the door was completely open. So it was a big like escape. Sign. Yeah. So when I come out of there with all that I was doing, as a matter of fact, I completely lost my voice after the first night. <laughs> I had to go home and do some uh, special theater type stuff to my voice just to get it back for the second and third night. But came out of that sucker and I mean, I had people swinging at me. You know how people react when they get scared. I <laughs> I had to dodge a few shots and dodge a few tackle attempts. And then there were just people who just fell to the floor groveling and fear and we had to help them into the next <laughs> room. <laughs> it was, But it was a lot of fun. Apart from that, looking back over all the stuff that we do during Halloween seasons, what can you think of that would be a favorite Halloween themed event or house, a haunted house or anything like that over the years? What can you think back and pull out? It's always tempting to say Halloween Horror Nights in Orlando, uh, Universal Studios, but I actually want to go a little bit deeper into not, not necessarily an indie haunted house, but you know, one that's a bit smaller and run by, uh, you know, just a smaller group of people. There was a house, and I think it might have been in Florida, one of those years that we were there, that we got there pretty late at night. It was maybe 10 o'clock at night, and we were the last people in line. But it was a really well-done haunted house. It was very small. They immediately walk you into a... I think I remember that. That was the yeah. one we ended up at, like, 11 o'clock or midnight, mm -hmm. yep. standing outside forever. And it was just, yeah, really cool, creepy little house. Yeah, yeah. we were told it was a great house. And yeah. from the outside, we were a bit concerned because of the long line and the scare actors milling about outside were really cool, but some of the costumes didn't seem to match up. But once we got inside, you know, it was very different because you walked in and the first room was a library and you had this person sitting down in full sight and they just kind of started to tell you a story. A few sentences into the story, they, they basically allude to the fact that you're going to have to make this journey that they're, they're talking about. And they kind of gesture to the wall and a false door opens. And it had a really cool effect. But you walk in and it was pitch black. It was a maze that was pitch black. Listeners of the show will know I'm, I'm kind of a scaredy cat. So <laughs> to be immersed in that total darkness and then have the door closed and then have to feel your way through the room, I was terrified. And I had a moment of appreciation as, sort of, as soon as that door closed. On one hand, I was kind of pissed off and I no longer wanted to be there. But on the other hand, I, you know, as somebody going to the attraction, I was like, okay, they, they have me enthralled at this point. I, I can appreciate this. So that, yeah. that was, probably has to be, aside from all the big special effects that somebody like Halloween Horror Nights can pull off. I think that was a really heartfelt haunted house, if you want to call it that. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I remember that. That that was a creepy little house once you got inside, out in the middle of nowhere on a mm -hmm. dirt road <laughs> in the back country, and it was just kind of like, what is going on out here? But it was it was really cool. And what about you? I mean, we've gone to a lot of haunted houses and different weird events over the years in the season. What, what's yours? You know, I've got a lot of favorites and a lot of things that I've enjoyed is what I've done or produced. You know, like that haunted hayride that we produced a couple years in a row. You were you were really young, but your mother and I helped produce this big haunted hayride that we both acted in and it was it was a lot of fun outdoors, you know, the cool weather and I think that 
one year, I can't remember what I did each year, but one year I did the whole chainsaw thing, but I came out of the woods, chased the thing, jumped up onto the buggy with everybody. And it was just, it was mayhem. It was chaos. And I loved every moment of it. <laughs> You know, but th there was a lot of things like that. The the little haunted houses that you kind of find off the beaten path, the haunted forests, and, you know, that homegrown mom and pop, put your heart into it event. I love those kind of things. There was one here, I think about two years ago, we went with the group from Comic Pop Library came over to visit us. I don't remember if it was that year or the year before, but we did uh, a house here in Tulsa one year where we went in and they had this one room that was supposed to be a swamp. And I love anything that's backwoods, swampy, voodoo, you know, Louisiana type, you know, give me down into bayou type stuff, you know. And I remember we walked into this, this whole house was kind of backwoods, Louisiana themed. And we walked into one that was supposed to be a swamp room, but it was done with laser lights, these green lasers and fogs that, and fog, fogs, what are fogs? <laughs> Green laser light and fog. But the laser light was like right up around your chest and the fog that the whole mixture, the way they did it, it looked like and felt like you were walking into water. And that green laser light was up around your chest. So you're automatically trying to raise your arms and your neck because you thought you were going under. And, and it was just a very simple, but very cool effect and very effective in what they were trying to do. And I just remember that was not, there wasn't much other than that and sound effects in that room, but it stood out to me as the best room in the house. Yeah, I think you had a guy in the corner, but he wasn't really coming toward you. He was almost like a red herring because I remember yeah. there's one part of that room that you had to kind of squeeze through these. Do they have know, red herrings in Louisiana? I, I, I have no idea. I don't okay. know what they have. But you had to squeeze through these inflatable walls to, that were underneath all of the laser lights and the fog. Yeah, so see that's them, right. But, yeah. You know, it, it definitely played on the paranoia of what. So you had that resistance feeling like you were wading through water as well. Yeah. Definitely had that unknown sense of, you know, what the heck is underneath that I can't see that's going to, you know, pull me under. Yeah. So there's a lot of times like that where we've created stuff, we've gone to visit. I always love going with groups of people through haunted houses and just playing up the fear and, and playing with the crowds. I mean, we've done everything from that kind of stuff to DJing dances on Halloween night. Night. You know, I don't, what was it, three or four years ago, we did a huge monster bash where we DJed the whole night and uh, it was just this crazy, massive rave techno monster bash party thing dance. Yeah, and then somebody <laughs> came up to this at the, was that at the beginning or the end when we were setting up the equipment or taking it down and you're like, you know, what do you guys not do? That was kind of fun. Yeah, well, you know what? I want to live an interesting life, so let's do as much as we can and <laughs> if that means DJing a monster bash and then creating a haunted house, let's do it. Oh, I know another big standout for me is, is again, this goes back several years, but a masquerade ball fundraiser that we did one year in a big ballroom in Orlando. We, at the time, your mother and I were working uh, for a costume company. So we were outfitting just outrageous Halloween parties throughout the whole season. And this masquerade ball was kind of our, you know, celebration of the season. And we got to go, we all created our own costumes and our own masks in a house and all went as a group. And I just remember having fun. It was really high class masquerade ball fundraiser. And it was just a lot of fun to dress up at that level versus the blood and the gore. So it's a contrast and experience, but one that stands out to me and one that I loved throughout the years. So yeah, you know, any of these kind of events you get to go to, whether whether it's a drunken brawl or, you know, universal <laughs> horror nights or mom and pop haunted houses or just going out with a group of friends from game night to a haunted hayride like we did last year, I think, with Aaron and John. I just love that kind of stuff. It's just fun. And to me, it's kind of relaxing because it's a cooler time of year. And I love watching everybody else grovel in fear, <laughs> you know, at all the scare actors. <laughs> It can be fun. Yeah, uh, for everybody out there listening, DC is entertaining in his own right to watch. I think there was one year that a scare actor actually came up to you and got the jump on you, but <laughs> your reaction was to do a slow motion, like, karate block. I know, I was like... 
because you were Lee, you in slow motion. <laughs> you were studying the special effects of somebody getting their their guts ripped out in the next room. So it was yeah, it was very funny because you don't typically jump, and you know that wasn't really a jump then either. It was just a very slow, relaxed karate block. And the guy just kind of looked at you funny, and then went back to his hiding spot. <laughs> <laughs> that same year, I think, is the one that I got lost in that zombie graveyard or something. I took a wrong turn. Yeah, it was You kept the... going and you ended up in, in the next room and I kind of got, because of the strobes and the lighting and everything on the ground, I took a wrong turn and got lost. So I'm like standing in the middle of these zombies and they're still trying to scare me the whole time and I'm just like, please show me the next door. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, the, the theme of that haunted house was a zombie apocalypse from the viewpoint of somebody taking pictures, like a, a journalist. So oh, yeah, yeah. it had a lot of um, glow lights, a lot of black lights, and then uh, it was mainly um, strobe lights. So you had a lot of flashes and disorienting, you know. Darkness. Yeah, so I got lost. I just completely went off the other side of the room. And as you made me walk forward in that one, or, you know, walk ahead of you in that one, much to my dismay, I saw you got lost and I got the heck out of Dodge. <laughs> I and when we say waiting. room, we're not talking like just a room in a, in a regular house. We're talking like each room is the size of a studio warehouse. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when was... I say I took a wrong turn and got lost in the room, I mean, I ended up on the other side of the factory. And this was a really cool room. It, it had a bunch of mannequins, which I don't like those either, but it had a bunch of mannequins that were dressed up to be zombies. And then you had scare actors kind of interspersed in between those mannequins that looked the exact same until you got right upon them. Mm -hmm. So I saw you going the wrong way. I think I tried to, I, I think I did at least try to get your attention, but. Yeah, but you I left wasn't, me for the dead. I was waiting around. <laughs> All right. So Michael, uh, jack-o'-lanterns are a huge part of our celebration, especially in the West of Halloween. Let's talk jack-o'-lanterns. All righty. What can you tell me about jack-o'-lanterns other than we carve faces into pumpkins? Let's take a step back first real quick. Actually, let's talk about a brief story of the Will of the Wisp. Okay, yeah, uh, you've got a story, I think, from Germany. Mm -hmm. a, sh a very, very short story from Germany you're going to uh, read. Go, go with that. And the reason we're going to talk about this is just because jack-o'-lanterns, Will of the Wisp, another... Uh, Fools fires. They all kinda, ignus fetus. They all kind of share this category of monster. So we'll we'll talk about that real quick. Okay. So this is from the Legends of the Rhine, 1899, by Helena Guerber. The marshy peninsula, which extends between Godorf and Rodenkirchen, is said to be the favorite resort of the sprite known all along the Rhine as the Hervich, and in England as the Will of the Wisp. This mischievous little creature is said to delight in leading unsuspecting travelers astray, and in playing all manner of pranks. But, like most practical jokers, he is quick to resent any attempt to make fun of him. One day a maiden, passing across this stretch of ground at nightfall, began to sing all the songs she knew, to beguile the loneliness of the way and inspire her with courage. Having soon come to the end of her scanty repertoire, she carelessly sang a mocking ditty about the hervish, who, enraged at her impudence, came rushing toward her threateningly, brandishing his tiny lantern. With a cry of terror, the girl began to run, closely pursued by the sprite, who, in punishment for her derisive song, napped his wings in her face and frightened her so badly that she became an idiot. Since then, the young people of Germany have never dared to sing the mocking refrain, and carefully avoid mentioning the Hervish's name after nightfall, lest they should in some way arouse his anger. A cool little story from Germany about the Will-o'-the-Wisp. It is. So uh, the reason I bring that up first is just because a jack-o'-lantern, you know, we typically see those as decorations, but that actually has a, a deeper story. And I, there's a lot of academic debate back and forth in the folklore community about the origins of jack-o'-lanterns. And we've talked a little bit about this in the past before, about how, uh, you know, this actually started out as a turnip mm -hmm. instead of a pumpkin. It's generally said that the jack-o'-lantern in Ireland were carved out of turnips, potatoes, and swedes. Right. And that when they came, like when the Irish immigrants came over to the Americas, they found pumpkins were actually better to use and started making those. Well, yeah. And they were 
much easier and much faster to grow. And, you know, in all the different climates, you could you could grow them. And, and like you said, they were easier to carve into. They were softer yeah. fruit, so to speak. Apparently, turnips are really hard to, <laughs> to yeah. get into. So there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of academic debate back and forth. There are stories in Ireland of, I think one we told last year was of a woman who uh, was pranked, basically. Uh, her, her son had carved this turnip face and nailed it into the inside of the chimney. I don't know if you guys have ever seen turnip jack-o'-lanterns, but they're scary looking. They look like weird alien mummies or something. Yeah, we'll, we'll post a couple of pictures of those up. So you've got those stories, but most people nowadays, you know, generally accept that as, as the fact. There are some people that, you know, go back and quote that jack-o'-lanterns were not really associated with Halloween until, I think, the late 1800s. And they say the first use of the term was in the early 1800s, about 1830 or somewhere around that, that range. So there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of interesting research to be done into this topic alone. Before you get into all of the other foolish fires, we we did an episode before our Halloween in July series about Stingy Jack, and mm-hmm. that kind of tells the the generally accepted story of the origin of the jack o' lantern. Right, and uh, basically just as a refresher, a guy named Jack tricks the devil twice. The, the devil doesn't like it, so he doesn't let him to hell. But because of his devious lifestyle and his stinginess, he can't go to heaven either. So he's stuck wandering the earth with this. Jack a lantern, this Jack of the Lantern figure. Jack of the Lantern. Yeah. Interestingly enough, it's said that you can put out a Jack a lantern to keep away Jack of the Lantern. And I, I never quite understood that logic. <laughs> You're going to put Jack out to keep Jack away. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Hey, I, <laughs> it is supposed to keep other sprites away as well, but it's supposed to keep him away just as, I guess, uh, I don't know. I guess he would be afraid of himself, almost like a vampire can't look at their own reflection. Yeah. And, and one of the, the stories and, and the beliefs about the jack-o'-lantern really is more about a simple lantern and how kids and families would carry these lanterns in certain times of the year in order to ward off evil spirits. And of course, you know, you, you go back to the whole belief system about light casting out darkness. So you're walking through the darkness with this light and it banishes the darkness and all the evil that is encompassed therein. So you have this belief stemming from that, you know, into the traditions and projecting into the traditions and and everything that we do today at Halloween, where we carve out faces and then we put candles in them or lights in them to light them up. The belief is you can put them on your porch and scare away evil spirits. And uh, that belief carries into traditions now. And now most people don't think of it anything but just fun. And of course, with the pumpkin being associated with that time of year and harvest, easy access, big pumpkin patches. And of course, if you think Charlie Brown, then you're (laughs) thinking the great pumpkin is coming. We trail off into a a never-ending cycle of new modern folklore and stories about the pumpkin and about the jack-o'-lantern. Which is pretty cool. And then going back around that same time that the jack-o'-lantern started to be associated with Halloween, you also have legends throughout Germany, like we just talked about, although that's the will of the West, but you also have them in Denmark and the Netherlands. Most of the time people think, again, jack-o'-lantern stems mainly from Ireland, but you have him across other parts of Europe, only in different forms. So in the Netherlands, jack-o'-lanterns were actually believed to be the spirits of unbaptized children. So you kind of have that... Sp- Which is really spooky to think about. Uh, definitely very creepy. And <laughs> it's... it's um, There are other Will of the Wisp stories that kind of follow the same idea that there are children who cannot go to heaven or to hell because they're unbaptized, but they're also innocent kids. Mm. That idea of purgatory on earth. So it's... Uh, it's a very dark thing to think about. Funny how religion makes things so dark. Yeah. It's supposed to make it light and happy and all that kind of stuff, but poor kids. So will-o'-the-wisps and jack-o'-lanterns, typically you you see them off in the distance and you want to stay away from them. It's actually kind of funny. One of the ways to, if you see a jack-o'-lantern, specifically a jack-o'-lantern, it's said that you definitely don't want to follow the light just because just like you don't want to follow a a will-o'-the-wisp. 
they will lead you astray and probably lead you to your death at the bottom of some bog. Um, but it said that when you see a jack-o'-lantern off in the distance, you want to find shelter, get away from it. If you can't do that, I guess the method of defense is to land face down in the dirt. <laughs> that's always helpful. Yeah. So, uh, huh. you know, I, other monsters and predators, that's not exactly the thing you want to do. But I yeah, guess I was expecting effective. you to say, like, you know, pull out the fire extinguisher or douse it with water or blow the candle out. But just throw your face in the dirt. You'll be good to go. Yeah. <laughs> So if you ever see that, that spooky face off in the distance, that's what you do. But and if you ever see people out trick-or-treating and just laying down and throwing their face in the dirt, now you know why they're doing that. Yeah. Either that or they tripped on their long mummy yeah, costumes. their mummy costumes, yeah. So it's funny, though, that you talk about holy water and stuff, because that's, that's kind of what we think about with Well, monsters. I didn't talk about it. You brought up the unbaptized children, like Rome and the Earth. Yeah, but you had mentioned holy water. Like, that's a common go-to for monsters. There's... I mentioned holy water? Yeah. Man, I completely forgot. I had no idea that I talked about holy water in this conversation. That's but, weird. But I mean, that's something you would typically think about with monsters, right? Like vampires, you know, you've got crucifix as holy yeah. water. Um, or like the bathtub of holy water and garlic from the Lost Boys. You can throw the vampires into it and... Fill up your water pistols. Yes. That was pretty awesome. Yes. I try that sometimes too, you know. I fill up like water pistols with holy water and go around to trick-or-treaters and squirting them in the face with it and it usually just pisses them off i would imagine so <laughs> especially probably adults burns. they want to fight probably burns the eyes i don't really do that not really i was just joking people i'm not that mean <laughs> <laughs> no we just corner people in haunted houses and make them fall to the ground <laughs> right that's right so yeah there there are a couple of stories of uh similar things where a priest would think to do the same thing. So there, there's a story about one priest who sees three. Is this why you never have like jack-o'-lanterns on the front porches of churches? I've never really thought about that, but maybe. Because like that would be like unbaptized babies on the porches of churches. Or like a lot of churches have their pumpkin patches where they're selling the pumpkins to make jack. Are they like selling the souls of unbaptized? I'm getting really dark here. Let's... <laughs> Let's go back to your stories. That's bad. So, I shouldn't think about that. So there's a priest that was bad uh, DC walking through the moors or the the swamp or whatever at one night, and he well, had... which was it? Was it the moors or the swamp? I think it was a bog. Now the bog. Okay, so the priest is walking through the bog, and he sees three of these lights rush up to him, which is kind of strange. Uh, most of the time they're off in the distance, but these actually rush up upon him, and it's almost like he's going to get mugged or something by these monsters. And he's actually very calm about it. He knows the background of these creatures. In this story, it's, you know, they're unbaptized spirits. So he actually takes them into the water right there and offers to baptize them. And they, they jump at it. So they, they allow themselves to be baptized and he's basically saving them. While that all sounds very good, what he finds, he looks up after those three and he sees hundreds of lights in the night. And he is then stuck there all night long in the bog with baptizing these will-o'-the-wisps and jack-o'-lanterns. A lot of kids want to go to heaven. Yeah. On one hand, it is creepy. On the other hand, it's sad. And on the other hand, it's it's kind of a, a cautionary tale still that you're going to get stuck with these things, whether you're going to do them good or not, or if you're following them and you're you know drowning in the end of a bog. These are just generally uh, monsters that you don't want to deal with. There's another story of a similar tale where a priest and his assistant are walking through another bog, because that's generally where you find these. And the assistant tries to bless it and tries to say, you know, in God's name, be gone. And you actually see more of them show up. And the priest says, you know, stop, you're making more of them appear. And he actually says, in Satan's name, be gone. And then they all disappear. So that comment... How rude. <laughs> all these poor unbaptized children's souls want to move on to heaven. And this guy's like, just go to hell. <laughs> so they, uh, the, uh, the idea of holy Man. water... I don't think would work on them too well. Well, I, I got to say this. Modern day, if you see like a bunch of little lights running up to you, please don't like dunk them in water or start blessing them or something like that because they're probably just trick-or-treaters with flashlights that are coming to get some candy and you're going to freak some people out. You start doing some weird stuff. Yeah. I think at, at, the, at best, just throw your face in the dirt and be <laughs> done with it. You probably freak some people out there, but at least you're not dragging yeah. anybody into the water. Those are some uh, examples of different types of jack-o'-lanterns as opposed to the, the singular stingy jack that um, we've gone over a few times on our podcast. 
Yeah, so listen, everybody, send us your photos of your jack-o'-lanterns, stuff that you've carved, put out from Halloween past, or what you're working on, or inspirations that you'd like to see, that you'd like to do this Halloween. In the meantime, we're going to switch over and chat with Richard Martin, the fear merchant, for just a moment, and get his perspective on jack-o'-lanterns. Richard Martin, once again with us on the Monster Guys podcast. Richard, we've been having a lot of fun this month for our Halloween in July. It's great having you each week. How are you doing this week? I'm good. I, I'd say you're sick of me now at this stage. I'm I'm glad the uh, guests are, the not the guests, but the listeners haven't thrown their hands up. They must be <laughs> sick of me. But no, yes, no. I, I am Richard, the fear merchant, and I just remembered that I never actually spelled out what the bizarre cast is. That's B-A-Z-A-A-R. It's not like the normal bazaar it's bizarre like the shop because you know i am the fear merchant is a little bit punny that's right <laughs> hey, we love puns on this show so yes so yeah here i am now again and we are discussing jack-o'-lanterns ahead of halloween in july yeah that's it and this is something that should be uh, a little closer home to you because this whole tradition michael started in ireland it did it's funny when the holiday came over here and kind of took off at that point because pumpkins were in north america they actually found out a lot of the irish americans at the time found out that pumpkins were great for carving faces into but it started out in ireland with turnips and i didn't know this until recently but also things like potatoes Mm -hmm. so you had much smaller jack-o'-lanterns at the time yes i don't know have you seen the sort of original turnip carvings it's absolutely terrifying if you just look up (laughs) jack-o'-lanterns on wikipedia guys it is like nightmare fuel it is you know we've we've talked about the uncanny valley with masks and scarecrows and it kind of continues even here and you wouldn't think it because uh, jack-o'-lantern today you know they have very triangular eyes and nose and the big goofy teeth they're very removed from our faces Mm -hmm. until you get to those really crazy guys who do like crazy carvings that look human but yeah turnips uh (laughs) those things look like they walked out of Silent Hill without the without the body. You know, they, they almost look like, especially that first one that Richard was talking about, they almost look like a dehydrated human head, like one of those shrunken heads or something. They do. I think that's what makes it so creepy. They do, and it's weird because they got, like, the teeth down. Like, they have the teeth behind the lips, and they're rounded, and they're small, and it just, I think what really bothers me about have to be the teeth. <laughs> Yeah, the um, teeth are just so co- as if they just, you know, gnaw down like a chainsaw your arm or something. <laughs> yeah, it does. You know, and, and of course we've talked about this, but the jack-o'-lanterns that we have in America today and in other parts of the world even are usually made out of pumpkins. And that's because of the the availability of the pumpkin over the turnip. But it started in Ireland. It started out, you know, with with the carvings into the turnips and potatoes and stuff like that. What about today in Ireland, Richard? Still a popular thing, jack-o'-lanterns out of pumpkins or turnips? And and what are they used? How are they used? Are commonly carved into what we typically see with the pumpkin? Or is it something completely different? Well, no, it is still very popular, but... Just to sort of peel that back a little bit, you were saying it started out in Ireland, but I suppose we haven't mentioned yet, and it's Halloween in July, but Halloween has stemmed from the Irish festival Samhain. So you can all thank everyone for Halloween to the Irish, which I'm surprised actually we didn't think about that so far. But Well, and that's going to actually be an even bigger topic next week. And, uh, yes, well, I can't wait to dive into that next yeah. week, Richie, because that is a very interesting aspect of, uh, I suppose, ancient Irish culture and how it's spread its wings into most of the Western world, at least. I'm not too sure about Eastern cultures and how they view Halloween. That's a bit outside my wheelhouse, but yeah. I know I know you're very into the Japanese culture over at the Monster Guys, so you might have a bit more insight, so it might lead for a better discussion next week. But this week, we're talking about jack-o'-lanterns. Yes, it is pumpkins pumpkins have made their way into ireland i'm not too sure when but as far as i can remember we've been carving pumpkins and i have always been given the opportunity to carve the pumpkins in our house and i remember one halloween we were down in Kerry and we couldn't get a pumpkin anywhere so we actually made a jack-o'-lantern out of a melon which is very disappointing because it was (laughs) 
maybe a third of the size and myself and my sister were very disappointed but my parents made the best they could out of the situation it and was functional it was functional <laughs> and yeah jack lanterns everyone leaves them out i always make a point at halloween because i've alluded to that i absolutely love halloween no matter if we're here there everywhere i always buy a pumpkin to carve into a jack-o'-lantern yeah i just love doing it i might make the same face every year with the carving but i try and mix it up but i don't exactly have the implements compared to some people you see that make absolute masterpieces on the pumpkins well and michael you have a favorite character that you've done many halloween where you actually completely gut the pumpkin and carve it out and you find pumpkins that are large enough to wear on your head are you saying that i have a big head you have a big head so (laughs) you carve out a pumpkin and wear it along with a a kind of a, a scarecrow type costume and then you wear that black sheer mask underneath it to cover all of your facial features so you're literally walking around like a black-eyed kid pumpkin wearing a scarecrow costume that's one of your hollow that's one of your uh yeah that's one of your trademark halloween costumes it is and it's it's really fun um we talked about this last year for our halloween episode there's one year that you and i were were doormen and (laughs) i got to i mean you were walking around as like the grim reaper ushering people in but i was actually standing in the yard and i think i had like some sticks sticking out of my arms so that it looked like i was actually being held up on a pole you absolutely look like you were perched on a on a scarecrow pole it was a lot of fun uh mainly because people would come up to me and then i would move and then they would scream and run and it's just part of the halloween spirit it's always (laughs) fun to see drunk people scream and run and (laughs) (laughs) it's so yeah it's it's a very fun costume to put on it's very heavy though on the shoulders so you just need to hit the gym a bit more there michael (laughs) i mean that that's enough of a workout carrying that thing around even with it you know all of the the guts taken out and the innards taken out you would think that it would be lighter but that pumpkin shell is heavy and very hardened on the shoulders so yeah well it's all very fun we love pumpkins here and usually grab pictures we'll post some more pictures this year of our jack-o'-lanterns and again we try to mix it up as well but jack-o'-lanterns richard uh, especially from the irish folklore tradition share a bit of that dimly lit legend of the will of the wisp what what can you tell us there well i don't know i'm not as read up as ye but I will try and give my best. So I suppose the Will of the Wisp, when you look at it, is the foolish fire. So it's kind of a, a ghost light. It's a bit of a glowing aura. Uh, we're not really too sure where the origin is, but it kind of draws travelers or people off the beaten path and to their doom, really. And for some reason, it transformed into Jack O' Lantern and people light that up. And I suppose it maybe transcended into being an idol for Will of the Wisp to some extent as a sort of a torch and a, a guide, maybe. So it's funny that you say guide. Uh, looking into Samhain a little bit more, people actually did use them. They would carve out the turnip and put a, I didn't know this, I always thought it was a, a candle, but I guess people also heat coals up and they would drop that coal in there Mm -hmm. and that would be kind of like a a glowing face as well but they would use it to guide people who were celebrating uh, Samhain through the night. So I guess they weren't always you know, leading people to their deaths in water or marshes, but they did have an origin here and there where they actually were beneficial, kind of like masks where, you know, they they get both sides of the story. The pumpkins and the turnips with candles in them or hot coals in them were used as guides, but not just guides for humans. A lot of people use them as guides to guide spirits back to their resting place or their relatives, their ancestors back to a place of peace, as well as a shield or a deterrent against evil spirits while they're walking around, along with the masks and the costumes. So it it certainly has a dual purpose. And Richard, earlier you mentioned about Asian cultures. There are yokai that are very similar to the Irish Will-o'-the-Wisp. And next week, we'll actually hear from Matthew Meyer, yokai expert on Japanese culture with regards to Halloween and the thinning of the veil and some of these yokai. So we'll get a bit of insight into that Asian and specifically the Japanese culture regarding these. Yes, looking forward to it. He's a very learned man. He is. He's a very intelligent and just a very sharp individual when it comes to folklore and history. And he does a lot of digging, which I I really respect, into, 
you know, the folklore that he touches on. So that's that's always a plus in my book. Are you aware, Richard, of the any of the legends of how Jack O'Lantern got his name? You see, I don't know. I didn't do my, my homework, I suppose, but I'm not too sure. I was wondering why it even became a pumpkin as opposed to becoming Jack. Because if it was Ternus before, where did the pumpkins come from? That's what I'm wondering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just that part of North America, because I mean, it was you know the pumpkin stems from North America, and like I said, when the the Irish immigrants came over, they found that uh, you know I guess turnips are really hard to uh, carve. Like I guess it's like a very thick hide. So when they came over and saw pumpkins, they tried carving that and found it to be much easier. Which I've always kind of had a little trouble carving pumpkins. I'm not the best at it, although I enjoy it and I love it. It, it kind of makes me wonder how hard it is to carve a turnip. Yes. Well, well, I suppose, yeah, sorry, DC, but the jack-o'-lantern, I suppose, it stemmed from the tale of Stingy Jack, a lazy, let shrewd blacksmith who yeah. uses a cross to trap Satan. One story says that Jack tricked Satan into climbing an apple tree, and once he was up there, Jack quickly placed crosses around the trunk or carved a cross into the bark so Satan couldn't get down. That is Stingy Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Well, pumpkins also took the place of turnips because of their wide availability. They were easier to grow here, faster to grow here, and as much as they were being used, you could grow them and find them a lot more readily than turnips. And then them being easier to carve, they took the place of turnips pretty quickly. No, I didn't yeah, because I suppose they're so big compared yeah. to a turnip. Because uh, as I was saying, I was very disappointed we had a honeydew melon <laughs> one year, and it's not as big <laughs> as a, a pumpkin at all. So it's, yeah. It's definitely a good vessel because it's hollow in the middle. And it's probably one of the biggest, I suppose, big hollow squashes, yep, yep. I suppose. Yeah. That, that, that makes me wonder how people ever use potatoes because <laughs> potatoes are so small. Yeah, but <laughs> you can get some pretty big potatoes. But I That's think true. potatoes were more, um, I, I'm not sure that they were used necessarily to put lanterns in as much as they were just for carving and, and fun. The faces. Yeah. So, Michael, what else about about uh, the legend. You were starting to talk to Richard about the legend and he brought a little bit there to light. Yeah, we touched on this last year and I, I kind of wanted to touch on it a little bit more this year because back then I had talked about how the legend was almost identical and um, it's questionable which one came first. And I actually did a lot of digging into this and there are several different legends that I was not aware of that spread out not only from Ireland and England, but also into uh, Denmark and Wales and Germany. Whereas Will of the Wisp is about a guy named Bill who goes and tricks the devil three times and he can't go into hell. The devil kind of pinches him on the nose with some blacksmith tongs and makes his nose glow. And so he's left to wander the earth. Jack-o'-lantern, while still a very similar story, he only tricks the devil twice and kind of gets the same treatment. Um, only instead of his nose glowing, he's given a jack-o'-lantern you know what would later become a jack-o'-lantern mm -hmm. uh, to carry around on the earth and so stingy jack became jack of the lantern wandering around the earth and people would put out their own jack-o'-lanterns their own scary lit faces to keep him from coming to their doorstep just because he was known as being you know if he's bad enough to trick the devil twice and stay out of heaven as well and they kick him out of hell you know I, i'm sure you wouldn't he's want somebody to look out for yeah yeah it's interesting. There are actually more than one jack-o'-lanterns, according to some of those old stories, you know, as a as a group of spirits. Well, I'm just glad I hadn't had to trick the devil not once, not twice. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, I've avoided him thus far, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> just just uh, don't ever trick him into becoming a coin to pay for a drink, and I think you'll be good. <laughs> well, and some people see the jack-o'-lantern as just a decoration, nothing more. But we know better. Yeah. Richard, touching on our discussions so far of scarecrows, masks, and now jack-o'-lanterns, the Headless Horseman of Sleepy oh, the Hollow. Du the Dulahan. The Dulahan, the Headless Horseman, the Oogie Boogie from The Nightmare Before Christmas, and Jason from Friday the 13th all oh get goodness. into an epic battle. Who gets taken out first and who's left standing at the end and why? Well, we've mentioned the Dulahan previously, DC. That's right, uh, that's right. We've had a discussion, if anyone hasn't heard that, uh, myself and DC have had a discussion on the <laughs> Dulahan and who was it? I can't remember. Was it Mother Russia? I yeah, I Yaga. think it was Baba Yaga. Yeah. 
And I Bobby think that was on, on your episode number, what, 10 of The Fear Merchant? I think it was episode number, uh, I can't remember, I think it was 8, 9, 10. Yeah, something like that. So if you want <laughs> to hear that discussion, go check out the Bizarre Cast from The Fear Merchant and uh, hear about our discussion about who's last standing between the Dulahan and Baba Yaga. Right, so who do we have? We have... We've got the, the Headless Horseman. Headless Horseman. The Oogie Jason. Boogie from Nightmare Before Christmas. And Jason from Friday the 13th. Right. Well, the Oogie Boogie from Nightmare Before Christmas, he was full of maggots, if I remember, or else I have a sick childhood <laughs> memory there. <laughs> no, no I, yeah. you're right there. Yeah, so I, I think he'll be the first to fall because, you know, just pure biology, he'll just consume himself. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> Always yeah, you Jason. with the science. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I... I have my background in science. I <laughs> I hate to admit because it kind of undermines all the superstitious stuff. But that's that's for another day. Um, Jason, he's kind of invincible though because he ended up lasting until was it three thousand or eight hundred years into the future? We'd say Jason X, <laughs> where he was frozen and came back to life and he killed everyone. Uh, is he's supernatural at this stage? I'd say it could be a stalemate. I would know. A stalemate between the headless horseman and Jason from Friday the Thirteenth. Yeah. Well, would since he doesn't have a head, would we say that he doesn't know where he's going, or <laughs> what? What are the parameters here? I don't know. He seems to get around just fine without without his head. Um, yeah. He, he is he fine. is he allowed to have that horse? Yeah. That's the main question. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The horse and the whip. He's got all all of his magic. The problem I have with Jason is the guy can't seem to catch up to everybody fast enough. That's true. Yeah, he walks everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the headless horseman's got a horse. Yeah. Uh, thus the horseman part. But I don't know. But the, it, could, the, it could be a case of um, the headless horseman, you know, he gallops away. And I don't know, have you watched that movie? Is it called It Follows? Yes. Yeah, you see that yeah, one? yeah. Yeah, so it could be like that where it's just Jason torments you for the end of the earth and he just walks. He and just walks forever. and always shows up. That's true. I mean, yeah, so <laughs> if you got a transatlantic flight, he walks along the bottom of the ocean and <laughs> every couple of months you have to move because Jason just walks towards your general direction you're going to get killed. I guess that's oh true. So, the, the Friday the 13th movies kind of introduced that whole idea of the warp walk where the main villain disappears but then appears in a completely different place for no reason. Mm, well, I, th I think the new Friday the 13th game introduced the, the warp walk where you can actually warp to different places. Uh, for the people in the audience who haven't heard of that, it's a new game that came out and I know I'm all about the games the last couple of weeks, guys. I'm sorry. But uh there's, I think, is it six people can play as camp counselors, and then oh one person gosh. plays as Jason, <laughs> and Jason has to go around trying to kill everyone. And I think as Jason, you can like warp to different locations yeah. to try That's and catch it. That's crazy. He's very overpowered. It's like a, it's like a really big game of very gory and brutal hide and go seek. <laughs> Yes, that's the perfect way to describe it. So, to answer your question, I think if the Headless Horseman wanted to, he could probably incapacitate Jason in his uh, slow, ambling walk towards destruction. I think the Headless Horseman might edge that one out. Gentlemen, have we completely lost focus of the traditional topic that we were on, the jack-o'-lantern? <laughs> Yes. I don't know. Now we're talking about warp, warp walking. I'm stuck on moonwalking. I don't think we can take this any further. It's, it's Halloween. We got to talk about it. It's Halloween. Time. We can talk about Jason anytime we want. Wait, that's confusing. Two movies, isn't it? Forget that. Yeah, that's a, Halloween, Jason. You brought up Scream. Three different movies. Richard's now. talking about games. If we're talking about Pumpkinhead, three different movies. Oh, so. my gosh. Now I'm confused. Com completely lost. Lost our way. <laughs> All right, let's let's uh, let's get back to the topic at hand. And Richard, thanks again for joining us. Next week, we will visit with you again, along with the others on our roundtable discussion about the Spirit Veil. Thanks again, man. And of course, we'll have all of your links in the show notes. Tell us again where we find you in your podcast. Yeah, so guys, uh, I suppose third week in a row for July, this is Richard Martin, a.k.a. The Fear Merchant. You can find my podcast, The Bizarre Cast, on thefearmerchant.com or SoundCloud. Just type in Google The Fear Merchant Podcast and you'll probably find that. That's B-A-Z-A-A-R cast. You'll find me. So thanks again for having me on, guys. It's been an absolute blast the last couple of weeks discussing all these topics in July. I hope you'll have something similar in October because I love talking about these spooky things. <laughs> Until next week. Thank you, Richard.
Very cool. Always good time talking to Richard. Thanks again, Richard, for hanging out with us this month during Halloween in July. Michael, it's been so hot. So, so hot. And I know I talked about this last week, but this week was even hotter and I can't stand the heat. Yes. So I am very much ready for autumn weather to roll in. I think I talked about how it was even hot at night last week, but it's it's gotten even hotter at night, so there's no relief right now. So yeah, I'm very much looking forward to Halloween. I think this year, of course, we'll do trick-or-treating, probably do a couple parties, fun stuff like that, the family stuff, our normal traditions. We'll put up our Halloween tree and do our trick-or-treat gifts, but I think we're also joining some friends for a Stranger Things 2 season kickoff party. So I'm pretty pumped about that. That show has really filled a gap in my mind for some great spooky entertainment. Spooky entertainment, and it harkens back to some good old days for cinema. I mean, I know it's not a movie, but it definitely has that feel. But it definitely has that level of quality. And it has all the gaming references that you would want as far as role-playing games and a bunch of crazy stuff. (laughs) Yeah, 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 all you gaming types. Me, I'm just like Uno and Dice and a couple other games, Pac-Man and... I'm good to go. You guys are all fancy smancy with your complex seven-headed games. Mm, two-headed demigorkins. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Will of the Wisps. And a lot. And here's the thing. A lot of people would not readily put jack-o'-lanterns in the same conversation as Will of the Wisps, but they're very much connected historically and through the stories and folklore. And so let's let's dive into that a little bit. Let's talk about Will of the Wisps and their connections to jack-o'-lanterns and Halloween and, and all that good stuff. Well, jack lanterns like I said earlier, it, it primarily pe- people think of them as decorations. And that's, I mean, that's what we buy them Yeah, as. that's what they've become. But that's not, that's not the whole of it. I mean, like we just went over, you know, they're, they're spirits, they're monsters. Or uh, in one case, they are a blacksmith slash farmer who tricks the devil too many times and can't go to hell or heaven because of it. The original story for Will of the Wisp or Bill of the Wisp was very similar where he tricks the devil three times by creating enchanted items that the devil gets trapped by and when he goes down to hell you know in the story he had stretched out the devil's nose with his blacksmith tongs and when he goes to hell the devil refuses him admittance and actually uses some tongs to light his nose on fire and so he goes and wanders the earth instead so it's a very very similar story you have a very similar name as well will of the wisps in popular culture today i think have a varied appearance i think i always think of brave where you have those spirits that kind of help out the main character and seem kind of cute and fluffy Mm -hmm. (laughs) but the truth is will the wisps are very dangerous as a natural phenomena nobody could ever pin down what exactly they were there were fires that would appear in bogs just as a natural phenomenon sometimes but a lot of people who discovered them they came up some with some of the weirdest theories i think one of my favorites was a guy who said oh the will of the wisp is nothing more than frosted potatoes and i had to scratch my head the first time i read that and i had to go back and read his, reread his explanation because i couldn't i had no idea how a frosted potato came off as a will of the wisp <laughs> <laughs> um, but I guess according to his idea or his theory at the time, he thought that the frost at night would turn the potato to mush, and mm. then the dew would freeze on top of that, and gulls would come eat that, and then as they were flying around, they would drop some bits of it or poop it out, and these frosted bits of potatoes would kind of make these lights at night. So some bizarre, strange thoughts back then. Very strange. But just to just to give an idea of the different types of... Ignis fatui, or the the foolish fire. I'm going to name off a long list of different things that are very similar to jack-o'-lanterns and will of the wisps. Okay. So we have uh, Billy with the wisp, or will of the wisp. We have uh-huh. Bobalongs, corpse candle, dead candle, elf fire, or elildan. Fetch candles, fetch lights, foolish fire, friar rush with a lantern. That's a fun one. Uh, you have gill burnt tail, hinky punk, hob and his lantern, hobladee's lantern, Jack o' lantern, of course. Jackie lantern. Jenny burnt tail. Joan in the wad. Kit in the candlestick. Kitty candlestick. Kitty with the wisp. Lantern man. Meg of the lantern. Merry dancers. Nimble men. Peg a lantern. Peggy lantern. Peggy with the lantern. Pinket. Spunky. Teen she. Walking fire. And then, of course, Will of the Wisp, sometimes known as Willy Wisp. And so that's... basically, you can you can just take your name or anybody's name and add like. 
owe the wisp and that's or lantern or <laughs> fire to it and you're pretty much a part of jack-o'-lantern lore yeah and that's just in england and ireland and scotland and the surrounding areas before we go into germany or jamaica or uh japan or anywhere else yeah so what should mine be like dc of the fire that's so metal. It's <laughs> totally metal. I want to play air guitar right now just thinking about it. Or is it DCO the Wisp? I'm trying to think because a lot of these are just kind of... Michael of the Lantern. They're more acute than anything. I mean, Jackie Lantern, Jenny Burnt Tail. You've got that... Michael Burning Fire. Michael Candle Fire. Mikey That's kind fire? of redundant. My, Michael of the... F what? Mikey Fire? I don't know. It's kind of weird. Michael of the Candle. <laughs> Michael the Michael of the lit I don't know whatever <laughs> just put your name with one of your we need to do one of those like memes that has like the charts to put your name with well one of those and then your birthday with another part of that name and in, make up your own jack o lantern name in the modern age too would you be like DC light bulb that's dumb <laughs> I'm not going to be a light bulb Michael LED I, I don't know that's not that's not too bad that's kind of techno-ish it's still not very folklorish, though. I don't. It, it's not. But some of these are just really funny to me. Um, I th I think the my favorite one has to be Friar Rush with a Lantern. That's a name. That's a long name. Friar but... Rush with the Lantern. Some of these are just epic metal, like Norwegian <laughs> metal names that you'd expect to find in a Norwegian metal band I, I playing would... out in the winter woods or something. No, I, I definitely wonder if Corpse Candle or Death Candle. I wonder Corpse if those are like can, a band name death somewhere. Death can corp. Yeah, I I think I can hear the songs now being written. <laughs> That's awesome. I love these names, Michael. Just a bit of trivia. Did you know that October nineteenth, two thousand thirteen, the most lit jack o' lanterns were on display at one time? They did not. How many were there in the city of Keene, New Hampshire, October nineteenth, and their pumpkin festival? You know they have pumpkin festivals all over the world. You right. know it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, but in Keene, New Hampshire, on this particular night, the most lit jack o' lanterns on display at one time. The number was thirty thousand five hundred eighty-one jack o' lanterns lit at one time. Golly, that's a lot. That's that is a, lot a more than heck I a lot of pumpkins. I see what you did there. You like that? Yeah. yeah. That is a heck a lot of pumpkins and fire 30,581 that's ridiculous we a lot of pumpkin pie on thanksgiving they, in King, so New did Hampshire. they get that all from within their own town or did they have to like go to different towns well to that i don't know I, i'd have to look that one up but pretty cool little piece of trivia i i don't know since 2013 if that's been if that record's been beaten or not but that's the latest that i have so if anybody has any other info topping that that'd be cool to hear about but that's um, a pretty cool festival to go see now just imagine all of those fires getting up and moving around through the night yeah moving through the woods showing up on your porch imagine all the people putting their heads in the sand <laughs> seeing those things that'd be a cool sight too <laughs> So funny. Will of the Wisp, let's take it a little further. Yeah, so you have your, your standard story of the Will of the Wisp, like we've talked about. Uh, don't follow it or, you're, or you'll are or you drown or at the very least you'll get lost or get stuck for the night. That's that's kind of the, the most Kind of well like I stuff. did in the zombie house. Mm -hmm. Yep. I followed the wrong light. <laughs> don't go to the, the zombie mannequins. <laughs> Somebody opened up the maintenance door and I went the wrong way. We have, uh, you know, the story that we told earlier of the girl in Germany. You you have these glimpses of other types of these sprites. Some are described as being gnomes that carry around a little lantern. Uh, we had that one that scared the girl that had wings. And he was also carrying a lantern. There's mm -hmm. also a story of a man. It was called Will of the Wisps with the long legs. And there's a guy that goes and follow. He's a daring sort, as the story calls him. So he goes and he tries to follow the Will of the Wisp. They usually run away, but he caught up with it. And he immediately found himself underneath this being, this very long-legged, almost giant creature that, you know, its head was a collection of fiery tips. And then it just disappeared. It, it completely left him in the dark. So once again, you have, you have yourself lost and, you know, it's hard to get home at that point. But you have these very different stories throughout with a common theme of getting lost. I don't know. It's just, it's very interesting to me. But then you also... You don't just find them on land. You also find them, what I didn't know until recently, you, you also find them pretty heavily in old sailor myths. Mm, yeah. uh, Pliny the Elder actually described a very common instance where if you have one ignis fatus or the foolish fire, 
on this ship, then it's called a Helen, and it's a sure sign that you're going to crash, basically, or somebody's going to drown. Um, very similar to the corpse candles, which I forgot to mention, those are basically a death omen for some people. It's a it's a sign that somebody's about to die, not just that you're going to get lost. There's that Norwegian metal band again, the corpse <laughs> candle. Yeah, so on, on board you have the Helen, which is a single fire. But if you have two of these fires, these fires will sometimes rest upon the heads of, you know, the sailors. They'll come down and just, like, sit on you, basically. And these are called the Castor and Pollux, which will probably sound familiar to people who know their stars pretty well. Mm -hmm. These are actually a sign that if you're in the middle of a storm or something, you're about to have calm weather ahead. So it's kind of like the the old idea that different numbers of birds in the sky have different meanings. To me, it's very interesting that you have one that's called Helen and it causes doom and despair and you have two and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> but yeah. based on it's that... It's not double the despair. It all of a sudden becomes nice. Two lefts make a okay. calm storm. I don't know. Two crows make a... Fairy godmother. I don't know. I okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's actually where a lot of ships started putting Castor and Pollux in their ship design, on their mastheads and such. Ah, very good. So you have those which have different meanings, either good or bad, but you also have a very specific legend of these fires appearing in prisons. And it's said that if they appear in prisons, any prisoner who looks upon them will soon die. So it was actually a thing that if you saw these these ghost fires or these foolish fires and you were imprisoned, then you kind of just gave up hope. You knew that you were going to be sent to the gallows soon. Kind of depressing, but... Yeah, and you could really play some tricks on people, like the guy down in mm -hmm. cell block A, like, puts a little burnt piece of hay through the window <laughs> to cell block B and is like, oh, ignus fatus, yeah. and the guy just freaks out because he thinks he's going to die. Here's a sidestep on that thought. So I was reading about a culture that, for Halloween, part of their celebration is they would put nuts and acorns in the the hearth of their, their fireplace, mm -hmm. and they would put little stones and mounds, basically, together. Yeah. There's a tradition that if if those are disturbed overnight, it's a sign that you're going to die. With it. If your pile of stones basically is going to be disturbed overnight, you're going to die within the year. Makes me wonder, number one, why you would even put the stones there in the first place. And number yeah, right. two, what happens if, you know, little Billy decides to play a prank and messes with somebody's pile of stones? Does that mean that... Oh, man. Or just somebody <laughs> wanting to take revenge on somebody else and yeah. leave them in fear for the next year. But it's kind of a similar thought of these prank... Will of the Wisps, which I'm sure somebody has done sometime in history. Oh, sure. But yeah, you've got these different types throughout Europe that have these very specific uh, meanings and very specific omens. You also have these in different parts of the world as well. It's a, you know, it's a common thing to have lights going through the night. In Japan, because we always have to visit there sometimes, yes. you have the Hitodama and the Kitsune B. The Hitodama is just a spirit fire. It floats through the forest and it's typically blue. You also have different types of fires that have different names and do different functions. I'm not going to go through all of them, but it's an interesting study all to itself. Yeah. And interestingly enough, the Hitodama, like if you go to yokai.com, Matthew Meyer's encyclopedic website on yokai, <clears throat> and look that up. The translation of that is human soul. Mm -hmm. Find it very cool. And the Japanese lore also has these will o' the wisp type blue flames over water, some in the sky. There's there's a lot of different uh, legends from that part of the world. And from what I've always seen, they don't just appear in, in one or two. They typically, like you'll find them in one or two sometimes, but they also seem to appear in great multitudes. So it's kind of spooky. Yeah. Um, well, they all want to get baptized. <laughs> Do they get baptized over there? You also have the Kitsune B, which is Foxfire. Mm -hmm. And this is specifically the Kitsune taking the form of the Will of the Wisp, basically where they breathe a ball of fire right in front of their noses. And they don't become fire, but they're off in the distance creating the same function where they, they like to play the trick of, you know, making somebody go off their way and distracting them. I didn't know until recently that there are a lot of these creatures in Jamaica as well and in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. But um, over there, they're called jumbies. There are different types of jumbies. And these are basically just like fairies or boogeymen. There is one in particular that is a, a hag, I think is one of her names. But she is an old woman who is actually a vampire. And at night, she'll take off her skin and stow it away in a mortar. 
her true form, the fireball, within that skin will actually fly around at night and go start sucking the blood out of people. Very similar to the old, 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 old Romanian vampire that was just a ball of energy. Yeah, or the old hag. Yeah. So it, you have this great connecting of the dots all over the world of very similar spirits that like to lead people astray. And then thinking about that Jamaican witch, you have these balls of light that also like to go and suck either the life force or the actual blood out of people. Makes you not want to follow these things at all. Unless you see two of them, apparently. Yeah, and you know what? I think in a more modern context, the whole cautionary thing there with you know don't follow the stranger so to speak yeah you can imagine how you know kids would play with lights but imagine a stranger coming down the way and you just see this floating light which a light against backdrop of darkness it just looks like a floating light but you follow it to check it out and then it's a stranger that can wisp you away yeah and you don't want to follow the stranger getting spirited away was especially a big concern of people in ireland and scotland Uh, even so far as to where they would not pick up a silver comb because they would be spirited away by a banshee. Yeah. And that typically meant that you were going to... Well, I mean, if you're a kid, you could be raised by the fairies and that might be okay. But if you were like a fiddler or somebody, you would be made to fiddle for what seemed like an eternity, Mm -hmm. only to be released later on when either all of your loved ones are old and gray or you would be released and turned to bones and ash. So not a good fate for anybody. So a fun and uh, whimsical and interesting conversation about jack-o'-lanterns and will-o'-the-wisp and other foolish fires from around the world. Hope you've enjoyed our conversation tonight. Next week, we're joined again by Richard Martin and also again by I.C. Sedgwick. And next week, we'll also add a third guest to a, a really cool topic. Matthew Meyer from Japan will be joining us next week and giving us an Asian perspective on the topic of the spirit veil. I'm pretty excited about this conversation because I I always love this topic, uh, the thinning of the veil during certain times of the year or certain times of the day or night. And we'll be talking about that in reference to Halloween and some of the festivals and rituals surrounding that time of the year. So three guests on next week's show with a very cool topic to boot. So don't forget to share with us your pictures, whether it be of jack-o'-lanterns, of scarecrows, of your costumes or spooky masks spooky masks we love to see it all keep the conversation going uh, over on twitter at the monster guys uh, or if you want to join us on instagram we're posting some photos over there we'll also be revealing more of the items that are going in the two giveaway boxes this month remember the three ways you can get your grubby little paws on those boxes <laughs> um one sign up for our newsletter on our website themonsterguys.com Two, leave us uh, a positive review on iTunes. Rate and review us over there. We love to hear your feedback and get good news over there. Three, leave us a tip in the tip jar over at patreon.com forward slash the monster guys. We certainly appreciate that. Every little bit helps to keep us going and make the show better. And hey, if you want to throw us a private message like our friend did this week just to encourage us, we love that too because we are humans too. We like encouragement. We definitely do. And it's always nice to know whether or not we're... uh reaching anybody out there in the great distance of the yeah, space. Yeah, you know, time. we've got a lot of growth and a lot of good things going on, you know, on the podcast and in other areas. But again, it's just it's just really special to know when somebody is listening and it inspires you and then you take the time to share that with us. It, it means a lot and we sit together and we read everything or if I find something or you find something, we pass it on to each other and uh, we share it around our family and... It, it just is a really bright point of our day or week receiving stuff like that. So thank you again so very much. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed this episode. And thanks again to Richard Martin, the Fear Merchant. Go check out his show, The Bizarre Cast. Of course, you can find all his links at thefearmerchant.com. And join us on Twitter at The Monster Guys, on Instagram as The Monster Guys. Like us on Facebook, The Monster Guys. We keep it simple. Keep it simple. Patreon.com forward slash The Monster Guys. <laughs> <Very simple. laughs> we should <laughs> if we don't keep it simple, we forget. Thanks again, everybody. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Halloween in July. Join us again next week. Three very special guests and a very cool and kind of spooky and spiritual topic, the spirit veil. Good night, everybody. Good night.